So we've talked about different types of currency systems and kind of talked about it primarily in, in the context of like how you exchange currency or, or what the, the relationships between currencies looks like and how that's determined. Uh, but currency systems actually encompass a, a bunch of other pieces that I'd like to talk about um, in this discussion of the impossible trinity. And this is really gonna tie into um, a, the documentary that we watch, uh, Commanding Heights, particularly the, the depiction of the Asian financial crisis in 1998 and how countries like Thailand and Malaysia and South Korea all faced um, currency crises and dealt with them in different ways. And we'll kind of talk through that example of Thailand and the bot as we talk about the impossible trinity and how it works. Uh, but to do that and uh, to get there, I want to first lay some some core vocabulary uh, that we, we're going to use and talk about just so we're all on the same page with that. Uh, so one of the terms that we'll be talking about is hard currency, uh, which is essentially currency that's widely accepted in international transactions. So the dollar, the pound, the euro, the yen, uh, these are currencies that are attached to large economies where they're cranking a lot of stuff that people might want to buy. So there's demand for that currency and they have open capital markets. So investors can come and go um, and, and buy and sell stocks and bonds and real estate and, and invest um, as they want. So hard currencies are currencies that are widely accepted for international transactions. And oftentimes countries will keep these currencies in reserve as part of their, well, what we call foreign reserves, right? The amount of um, currency and other assets like gold um, and special drawing rights, which we'll talk about in just a second, um, that are held by a state's central bank. So the, the institution that's responsible for managing and maintaining currency policy and monetary policy is gonna hold these, um, these foreign reserves and they'll be used to help support and maintain the currency as well as a variety of other things. Um, special drawing rights are a essentially IOUs that are issued by the International Monetary Fund and are used by central banks amongst each other. And so if a country doesn't have enough um, hard currency on hand, enough dollars in their, in their vaults, um, they can take special drawing rights, uh, this IOU, and give it to another central bank, and that central bank will transfer in hard currency that they can then use to you know, exchange you know, dollars for pounds or whatever it is that you're trying to, whatever exchange you're trying to make. So it's essentially a, a money moving system amongst um, central banks that was created to sort of create greater liquidity, the ability to move money around within the system. Okay, so that's foreign reserves, the amount of hard currency and other assets that your central bank has on hand. Ideally, that's a large pile, right? You've got lots of, of um, foreign reserves. Um, when you run out of foreign reserves, that's bad. And so when we're thinking about where do those foreign reserves come from, it used to be that we would track current accounts which would be um, the value of your exports, right? Stuff is going out and money is coming in. So hard currency is coming in minus your imports, um, stuff is coming in and hard currency is going out. And if your exports are greater than your imports, then you've got more stuff coming out than coming in, more money is coming in than going out. And you get these greater piles of um, hard currency in your foreign reserves. And so current accounts, a positive current accounts balance means your foreign reserves are gonna be growing. We don't track current, uh, current accounts quite as much anymore, um, in part because since uh, 1971, when the United States walked away from the fixed exchange rate system, um, international finance has really opened up, and now it makes much more sense to, to track balance of payments, which is the net flow of money assets into and out of an economy. And so it includes exports, which is stuff going out, money coming in and investment inflows, which is money coming in. People are buying stocks and bonds and, and real estate um, within your country, they're bringing money in. Um, and then we subtract from that imports, which is um, stuff coming in, money going out, and investment outflows. So I take my savings and I go and I invest in another country. Money is leaving my economy, hard currency is leaving my economy. So it's, it's the overall sum of um, money coming in and going out of an economy, and again, if that balance of payments number is on the positive side, your foreign reserves are gonna grow. If it's on the negative side, your foreign reserves are gonna shrink. Um, you've gotta balance that somehow. Okay, so we've got this idea of, of, of all these different vocabulary pieces and hopefully we kind of see how this idea of balance of payments and hard currency and foreign reserves all kind of fit together. Um, now let's talk about the impossible trinity. And so the impossible trinity is essentially this idea that in a currency system, there are three things you might want to have, three things you might want to see 
Um, but you can only have two of them at the same time and have the system remain stable. And so one thing that you might desire is a fixed exchange rate. You want predictability in your currency. You wanna know what that currency is gonna be relative to other currencies day after day after day. That's a desirable thing. Another thing that's desirable is free capital flows, right? You may want to be able to move money around the world. You may want to take your dollars and invest in the Japanese stock market, or people in Japan might wanna take their yen and come and invest in the US stock market. There is um, a lot of positive things behind free capital flows. Money can move where it's most likely to get an efficient return, um, but particularly for developing countries, free capital flows are potentially desirable because they can provide a source of investment. Uh, it can provide a source of, of economic growth to have external money coming in um, and, and financing development, financing factories, financing um, economic activity. So free capital flows are oftentimes desirable. People may be hesitant to bring money into your economy if you have what are called capital controls, which are the opposite of free capital flow. Um, so China, for example, has capital controls. Um, you know, I was working in China a, a couple years ago at a, a fellowship and I got paid in, in RMB and I went to, to try cash that out and I was told at the airport, well, you can only exchange, um, I think it was like a thousand RMB um, per day per passport, which was frustrating because I had, you know, multiple, multiple thousands of RMB, RMB that I was trying to convert over. Um, multiple is like four, um, but it meant four separate trips back to the uh, uh, to the airport to, to make those exchanges just because of capital controls in place, preventing the rapid movement of money into and out of the economy. So free capital flow is a desirable thing. And then the final thing that we might desire in a currency system is sovereign monetary policy, which means the ability of a country to set its interest rates for the good of the country. If you're setting your interest rates to curb inflation and you're setting your interest rates to ensure full employment, that is sovereign monetary policy. You are, you are guiding your monetary policy and setting your interest rates for the good of your economy. The opposite of that would be that you're setting your interest rates for somebody else. Um, in, in, in the context of what we'll be talking about, setting your interest rates to please foreign investors, to draw in foreign investment. Okay, so we've got this idea of the impossible trinity. Um, let's now talk through sort of how this works and, and how all these pieces fit together, um, keeping in mind the idea that while you can try to do all three of these things, um, it will be unstable. And over the long term, you're only going to be able to manage um, two of these things. So during the 1950s, 60s, and, and early 70s, most of the world was on a currency system um, that involved a fixed exchange rate and sovereign monetary policy and abandoned free capital flows. There were, there were capital controls that prevented money from moving around rapidly. In 1971, the United States walks away from the gold standard and the fixed exchange rate system, drops that and moves to a floating exchange rate system, and then opens up free capital flow and starts investing around the world and allowing investment to come in, removing capital controls that, that had really strangled that in the, in the past. Um, and so the US shifted to a different kind of currency system, rebalancing on this impossible trinity. And over the 70s and 80s and 90s, many countries around the world um, also abandoned that fixed exchange rate. And in some cases, um, uh, opened up free capital markets. Um, other countries try to open up free capital markets while holding on to the fixed exchange rate. And so that's the bind that Thailand finds itself in in 1998, where Thailand had been opening up its capital markets, allowing money to come in. And there had been you know, very large amounts of investment coming in relative to the Thai economy um, from Japan because interest rates were incredibly low in Japan and bankers were looking for better opportunities and, and better rates of return. And they've invested in, in Thailand's um, economy. So there was all this money coming in, but Thailand was holding on to a fixed exchange rate. Basically, they were promising every time you bring us a Thai bot to the central bank, we can give you a dollar which works really well when you have large foreign reserves on hand and you can always make those transactions. Um, unfortunately, um, speculators got wind that perhaps 
Thailand might not actually have enough dollars on hand to support the Thai bot and began selling off Thai bots, um, basically demanding that the central bank convert them over to dollars. And the central bank was um, shelling out dollars and the foreign exchange uh, or the, the foreign reserves in the, the central bank were shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And all of a sudden, the central bankers opened up the vaults and realized there were no dollars left, that their foreign reserves had hit zero. And there was a long line of people queued up wanting to convert Thai bot into dollars. This is a currency crisis. One of the three things in the impossible trinity is going to have to give. It has to. You've got a problem. People are lined up and they want to exchange Thai bots for dollars and you have no dollars to give them. So option number one is you can abandon the fixed exchange rate. You have a balance of payments crisis. You don't have any you know, currency on hand to, to, to make that conversion at the fixed exchange rate that you were promising. You can go out to the people waiting in line to make that, that currency conversion and say, look, I know you thought we had a fixed exchange rate currency. That is no longer the case. We are not going to be supporting an exchange rate, um, giving you dollars for bots. If you want to get rid of your bots, go and see what the international markets will give you for them. We're moving to a floating exchange rate where the value of the bot, the value of our currency is determined by markets. So one way out of this currency crisis, out of this balance of payments crisis is to abandon your fixed exchange rate. That will resolve it. You've dealt with a line of people out the door. That's one strategy, and that's a strategy that Thailand did use, and it resulted in a collapse in the value of the bot um, very rapidly because everybody thought that it had a certain value and suddenly it, it didn't. Um, the second strategy um, that you, you can use with this problem, that there's this line of people who want to convert this currency and you don't have the dollars to support it is to abandon free capital flows. To say to people, look, you're lined up here because you believe that you can just take your money out whenever you want. And sure, that's how it has been, but that's not how it is anymore. That you people are all leaving because you have this belief that somehow the Thai economy is unsafe. Well, you can't take all your money out. Um, you can only convert $100 worth of Thai bot a day and come back tomorrow, or in fact, come back in six months. Um, we're not going to do any currency conversions for six months. So you impose capital controls, you prevent money from moving out of the economy. And that will, will fix the problem, right? The, the line of people queued up will, will go away. Um, in terms of a short term solution, that can work too. Um, and in fact, this is what Malaysia does. Malaysia sort of looked at the situation and said, you know, everybody's freaking out because Thailand's having a currency crisis. You think that we're going to have a currency crisis, and so you're running for the exits. This is completely irrational. No, you're not leaving. And no, we're going to, and yes, we're going to impose uh, capital controls and come back in six months. And if you still want to leave, then we can talk. Um, and this actually works in, in Malaysia, that it, it stems a lot of the panic and Malaysia is able to kind of stabilize its, its currency and, and uh, get through the, the Asian financial crisis better than I think many other countries. But abandoning free capital flow is potentially risky over the long term because a lot of that investment that was fueling growth was being facilitated by the belief by investors that they could come and go whenever they, they wanted to. And if you invest money into an economy and you can't get that money back out, you can't bring it back home to your own country or you can't invest it elsewhere in the world, investors might be hesitant to throw large quantities of money at a country um, with investment in the future if there's capital controls in place. So that's a solution. It has potential drawbacks, but I guess so did abandoning the fixed exchange rate in that your currency value collapsed. So I guess both are bad. Um, the third possible way to deal with this problem right? That investors are lined up, they have Thai bots, they want to convert them to dollars, and you don't have any dollars. The third possible way to deal with this is to try to rapidly raise dollars. And one of the ways that you do that 
is by bringing in foreign investment or in fact just keeping money in place so that all the people who are lined up decide that they actually don't want to leave and so one way to do that and probably the only way to do that in a in a balanced payments crisis is to say to people look why why would you ever want to take your your currency out of thailand thailand has the best situation on the planet in fact we're willing to offer you six seven eight ten 15% interest on government debt. You're not going to find a better opportunity anywhere in the world. Why would you want to leave? You'll want to stay. And the line of people, you know, waiting out the door say, oh, actually, you know, that's that's a really good rate of return. I can't get that elsewhere. And in fact, money might start flowing in, right? You might get more people investing who want those incredibly high interest rates. And you've solved the problem in that you've, you've dealt with the balance payment crisis. You've, you've started to replenish your foreign reserves but you've abandoned the idea that you're setting interest rates for the good of your own economy. Now you're setting interest rates to appease international investors and make sure that they keep their dollars in your country and don't try to take them out. And when you do that, you're going to put this crushing weight on your uh, domestic economy that's going to you know, grind down the domestic economy. It's going to um, raise um, unemployment, it's going to have this huge effect on, on people. And so maybe that's not a desirable thing as well. Um, and so one of the, the main takeaways with the impossible trinity is that if you have any two of these things, there's always a safety valve, or there's usually a safety valve. Um, if I want to have sovereign monetary policy and free capital flows, I can do that. And I can resolve that by having a floating exchange rate where if people are, are if too much money is moving in or out, the change in the currency value sort of adjusts for that and deals with that. But when you try to hold all three of those pieces at once, you can find yourself um, in, a, in a balanced payment crisis where you don't have enough money. Now, it was sort of known um, under the Bretton Woods system that balance of payment crises could happen, even with capital controls, that if some countries were you know, um, importing more than they were exporting for a protracted period of time, they might experience a balance of payments crisis. Um, but the Bretton Woods system had sort of a mechanism in place to kind of help deal with that, and that was the International Monetary Fund, which could step in and help countries in periods of, of financial distress. The Bretton Woods um, system, the International Monetary Fund, still sort of plays that role. The International Monetary Fund operates as a lender of last resort um, that will provide an influx of cash. And so when countries are facing, facing balanced payment crises, um, there is a fourth way out of this, right, of the impossible trinity um, of abandoning, you know, a fixed exchange rate or abandoning free capital flows or abandoning sovereign monetary policy. The fourth way out is to accept loans from the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund, however, oftentimes demands major economic reforms that can be incredibly painful as well as part of securing these loans and may actually um, make adjustments or tweak um, exchange rate policies and sovereign monetary policy and, and capital flow policy as part of a larger system of reform, but it can avoid some of the the sharper shocks that can come with, um, with these kind of uh, rapid shifts in, in a currency system.